Good morning. How is everybody doing? Enthusiastic for a Sunday morning, I like it. Uh, has anybody been into the trailer hall already? Yeah, I'm seeing some, some bags around, some rustling, excellent. Okay, so welcome to our first panel for Sunday. Um, and just before we start the panel, I've got a few announcements to rattle through because people have basically lost things because they probably had a good time. So, um, I'll start with the boring lost, lost announcements first. So, uh, we've got a debit card that has been handed in um, yesterday from Clubcom. Um, if this is you, please can you make yourself known to the reg desk um, just to check that it's you. Uh, so yeah, bridge desk, just the other side of here, if you've lost a debit card in the last 24 hours. Uh, and also, could Kobe Bunce please also make yourself known to the bridge desk, because we have found something we believe belongs to you as well. Uh, and separately, um, on the fourth floor, an armada figure was found. Why are you laughing? What's wrong with an armada figure, guys? We love armada. I do, anyway. Um, if you have lost... Uh, an armada figure, we won't say which one because otherwise you'll all come rushing for it, no doubt. Um, please again just make yourself known to a member of staff at either um, the trader hall or the reg desk and we'll reunite you with your dream toy. Um, okay, another couple of announcements. Uh, if you haven't already heard, unfortunately Andy Cousins is not able to join us this weekend um, due to illness, so we're very sad and he's very sad not to be able to join. Um, However, his, um, his wife has come today and has brought lots of his prints um, to see and to buy at his table. So um, they're really, really fantastic drawings of um, toy, early toy concepts. So please do go and check that out over in the trailer hall. So yeah, his prints are still available, even though he unfortunately cannot join us in person. Okay, I believe that is all the announcements I need to give. I'll return this back to Rock himself. Thank you very much. Okay, so without further ado, please can we welcome our two guests to the stage for this panel on writing. Please welcome May Katz and James Roberts. <laughs> Because I'm so short and small. Yeah, if you're like, power, like you're like, power. Like, uh, yeah. Alright, <laughs> much better. There we go. Got the man in the middle. There aren't that many men involved in Transformers, so it's nice to, you know, showcase them. Such aggression. It's not aggression. Why is aggression? Why is it perceived as aggression, James? Well, it's so much irony then. Oh, I like, <laughs> How are we both doing? Yeah. Good morning. Yeah? <laughs> It is morning. <laughs> it is certainly 11 a.m. Yeah, it really, really is. <laughs> to me, it's like 6, 7 a.m. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's rough. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. We really appreciate you coming down for the first panel of the day. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is your second panel of the event. Yes. Yeah. So you're seasoned. It's true. Yeah. So, show of hands, who was at the panel yesterday with Maycat? Yeah, okay, a lot of people. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Amazing. So obviously we're going to hear more from May today uh, and from James. We, we mentioned James in the panel actually, didn't we? Yeah, of course. I yeah, steal we... all my best stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah. we'll start off, because this is a panel on, on writing, um, and we'll start with you, May. Um, could you tell us how you got into writing? Oh, sure. Um, sorry for people who are going to hear this repeated story, but I got started writing about when I was 13, I started writing like non-stop Matrix fan fiction. Um, that's all I did was like do homework, sleep, and write fan fiction. So those are my weird proving grounds. And then uh, I was 14 and someone got me Final Draft, which is screenwriting software. And I grew up in Los Angeles, so it was sort of a given that I would like somehow work in Hollywood. Uh, and then I wrote a 135 page screenplay that was terrible. I was 14, but it's mine. And I've been, I haven't really been stopping ever since. Wow. And how, off the back of that, how did you make your breakthrough from you know, writing screenplays as a 14 year old in fan fiction through to yeah, so professional work? Th this is hard because like this is how I became a professional and it's completely unreplicatable, but I won a high school screenwriting contest 
when I was like 14, 15. And part of the prize was meeting industry professionals, including a cat named Greg Wiseman, who has made Gargoyles and Young Justice and Spectacular Spider-Man. And so like literally a decade later, I ended up in a meeting with him again. And the meeting was, in my head, I was just gonna be like, look Greg, I'm still alive and I still wanna do this. Um, and he offered me a script on Young Justice, and that was my first professional script that I ever got. Um, and when I got the Cyberverse job, I couldn't give them the Young Justice script as a sample, but it was like the fact that I had done it was enough for them to be like, yeah, we'll take a chance on this person. Wow, that's awesome. Imagine having your first job on Young Justice. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> <Very cool. laughs> it's wild. Amazing. Okay, James, same question. How did you get to writing? Um, <clears throat> Well, there's a bit of an overlap, actually, in the fanfic yeah. origin. It's not Matrix, though. I, I, I was writing Transformers fanfic when Matrix came out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, this, I suppose my fanfic journey began uh, when G1 was, seemed to be dead forever, so in the early 90s. And, um, and apologies again if you've heard this origin story before. But yeah, there was, there was a group of us um, in the UK, mainly, of uh, fans that would we'd write our own, but it would be collaborative in the sense that um, unusually in those days in the fanfic world, you know, you had to have regard to what other people were writing, so it was a shared universe that you, write, you were writing your fanfic within, and that was useful. Um, so did that, and that kind of, in, in terms of scale and ambition, maybe not in quality, but it, it grew to, this, to Eugenesis, which was a book-length thing, um, which I sort of sold at, at not, not this con, but an early... Well, why not? You should, yeah, you should but, get hold of some 20, 22 years ago, so... Um, yeah, and then, and then that was kind of it, really. I, and I, I, uh, this was all prose stuff, uh, not comic stuff. Didn't really have designs to do comics. Did kind of want to be a novelist. Um, so did some sort of other non-Transformers unpublished stuff. Uh, and then skipped forward a few years, and there was an opportunity with IDW, which brought me into the comics, and, and it went from there. Had you not written a comic book beforehand? Only, I'd done, I'd done a, literally two or three fanfic comics. Um, and then Last Under the Records was the first. Damn, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it hit. That's like your first professional script being Young Justice. You're just like, oh. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. But, it, but it, was, it was a, I was thinking, I was talking to Nick about this the other day, and it was, um, I mean, thankfully, there was, there was a, a, a leading time between submission and publication, and so there was time to fix and correct and stuff. So my very first attempt was different to, uh, to what we ended up with. Um, and for both of you, I guess, what are the differences in, in writing for different mediums? I can only assume you know, for writing prose where you have full control of everything versus for a comic where there's a limited number of panels, limited number of characters, you know, the artists might say, excuse me, why is there 50 characters in every single panel? And then obviously similarly for, for, um, for shows. Sure, I've uh, started flirting with writing for comics um, and I've been given opportunities that luckily play to my strengths because comic book writing, as I have been learning, is very much like you have to somewhat dictate what's on the page. And this is, you know, my weakness as a writer. When I'm writing scenes, I really don't see the space. I just see like faces emoting and I hear the dialogue, but I'm not really concerned with what does the set look like that's going to be designed and drawn by other people or, you know, there's a production designer. So switching into comic books where they're like, no, you have to tell the artist what to draw and to keep in mind that the story is now like 22 pages and that to be page flipping is a part of the experience and like I'm still learning how to play to that and how to write for that. I mean, I can't speak to, to, to writing for the screen so, um, so my, my experience is limited to, to the page. But I was thinking before about how in contrast to sort of books and to movies, um, with scripted TV, well, in, even nowadays, because the sort of um, with streaming, we've moved away from a very rigid runtime. But that aside, you know, um, one of the things I think which, which TV writing and comic writing has in common is there's there's a need for economy uh, precision because you know you've got a limited amount of page space or of, of screen time to sort of work with it. Um, and yeah, particularly in comics, as you were just saying now, it's. Um, Particularly if you do a full script, which um, I don't know if you're. So you are you doing it like a, a written um, storyboard release that you're describing panel by panel? Yes, I'm doing my best. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. and it's um, 
and then you're very, very much aware of, of, of what space you've got, and as you say, in the page turns and the cliffhangers and things. And um, yeah, it's um, they're both unique. There's some overlap, but they're both kind of unique disciplines, I think. Yeah. Apart from the actual telling of a story. Yes, yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> and do you both have uh, any examples where what you've put forward is just absolutely not fitted within the respective parameters or? I'm sure you get feedback every, you know, every time you, you write something, but any examples? I tried to get away with something. It was a tight deadline, and I feel like I really advertised how new I was to comics, and I was really trying to get away with not dictating the page, and they just, the editors were just like not letting me do it. And also, like I, if left to my own devices, my dialogue tends to be verbose. Like a common criticism I would get when I was much younger was that like I'm writing plays, not movies. Um, and so there was just this, the notes I kept getting were just like, this is just not going to fit in a panel. You need to stop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, in the early days, I think I was prone to that as well. In the very, very early days, I mean, I, I, this was you know, very early on. It was, I'd grown up on the, um, it's, it's funny actually, as an aside, you think how sort of the grammar of comics has changed over the years. And you know, back in the day, there was, there was thought balloons and there was a lot of, you know, there was a reliance on captions. And, and there was almost in some, if you go back far enough, there was kind of a, a verbosity to it and a kind of, um, you know, exposition heavy and stuff. So yeah, got to wean yourself off that. But to answer your question, I remember when you're when you're starting out, you, you break you break rules that you don't know exist, and then often there's a good reason for it. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you, by breaking the rule, you know, you can do good stuff. But I remember I did a flashback within a flashback, which. <laughs> You know, I know exactly, so there's a level of derision through the audience there, and quite right too, because it's like some Inception style thing where it's just, you know, uh, that's just confusing. So I did away with that. And then I think the other thing was, yeah, just learning. I remember a, a, an early editor said, um, in, in a, for IDW in those days there was a rule and it was no more than six panels per page, no more than three balloons per panel, no more than three sentences per balloon. But I mean, that type of thing is too prescriptive, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't you spend too much time trying to sort of work to those rules and, um, and you realise they, they're arbitrary. And... No? Great answers. Um... It's nice when you get you know, great answers. Yeah, great answers. It's good to get feedback. Yeah, great answers. Yeah, yeah. 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 So when, right when, when, when we answer. don't hear that... In You'll be like, that's right. not the answer we were looking yeah. for. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell us, I know we touched on this a little bit yesterday, uh, May, Writing within a world where so many, so much of the assets are already defined, um, and you know, pre-existing characters with you know, their law, their history, their previous versions. How do you um, deal with that? And then how do you put your own spin on it? I sure, guess. sure. I was um, when I was kind of thrown into the Cyberverse writers' room. I came in season two, so the train was kind of already in motion. And there was a lot of a learning curve. I was writing 11 minute episodes and all this stuff. Um, but what I kind of quickly realized in that environment was like, oh, I, it's very difficult for an IP that is 40 years old to come up with something that is wholly original. But what I can do is understand that like, well, someone like me hasn't necessarily been able to contribute to that 40 years. So what can I as an individual bring to this uh, to this IP that will con that will contribute um, uh, contribute something of meaning to them and so you know I do this a lot with like things that I get to write for that I was already a fan of but there's uh, there's kind of a experience of this has given to me so what can I give back to it um, and once I kind of figured that out I was like this is how I write for IPs this is how I'm going to survive this IP driven world. And that becomes, it's very empowering in that moment to not be um, intimidated by the amount of content that has come before you, but to be able to take it and be like, all right, what am I gonna do with this? Um, and then, yeah, and then I just, you know, we all look in the mirror and be like, what am I gonna do with this? <laughs> and James, same question. Same question. Um, I think <clears throat> it was a case of uh, being a fan for so long, um, well, being a fan and then kind of just doing other things and sort of coming back to it. And for so long, it was like you know you've been, you're pressing your face against the glass, you know. And there's there's this sort of content kind of 
horrible word actually, you know what it says, so stories um, and, and stuff comes down from on high, you, you know, you're not, you're not privy to, to who makes those decisions, you know, you, maybe you've met the creators, but, you know, it just, it arrives and you, and you enjoy it and you consume it or you don't. Um, and then suddenly, this insane opportunity to, oh, I can, so, so you know, you've taken the glass away now, so I, I, can, I can play with this stuff now and I can, and I can do things of my own. And you don't know how long it's going to last, but for me at least, I thought, well, I'm going to, Suddenly, the, the distance between the ideas that I've had in my head for a long time, or new ideas, the distance between concept and execution is so 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 short now. So let's just see what you can get away with, you know. And I think um, I was talking to Jack about this. I think the our kind of um, our era, the IDW era, um, it recedes into the past, and, it, and and as it does so, you kind of you get a different perspective on it. Um, and it, I may be wrong, but it, it might be equally that we had um, a lot of freedom. We, we knew at the time we had freedom, but I think perhaps maybe we didn't appreciate the extent to which we were generally allowed to sort of try things out and test things out, and, and we were really lucky. Yeah. Did you, did you find being a fan for so long was something that empowered you or something that was like intimidated you when you finally got the opportunity? Um, I, th I felt. I felt maybe arrogantly, I felt empowered. I thought, yes, okay, I, I think I've got good stuff. <laughs> You're like, but, oh, I got this. <laughs> but, but what I did, but there's a downside to that. And I thought, I, I think particularly early on, um, there, was, there was some in-jokes and there were some references and things. And, and I was, I, what audience am I, am I kind of playing to, really? Um, I'm sort of, maybe I'm, you know, a, a little nod, a little Easter egg here and there is, is good fun, but you can't build a story around it. Um, and it was, Quite healthy to wean myself off that, um, and not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sort of, um, I'm not implying anything. I'm not particularly referencing anybody in particular. Just generally, um, doing your own thing, being less reliant on stuff that's gone before, um, and recognizing that there's kind of diminishing returns if you're always kind of nodding to other stuff. So that, that was a necessary lesson. Nice. Um, I guess off the back of that, um, how. Um, May in Earthspark, there's obviously lots of referencing, and you know the first, you know, the first opening pilot of um, you know literally G, you know G1, um, you know when when you get the brief history. I certainly wasn't referring to that. Yeah, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> As in like, <laughs> wow, what are you trying to stir? Up? I'm not trying to stir anything up. Um, but you know, was, was, was it? Sorry, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, was that was that your you know your idea, or was that given to you that we want to almost directly well, came, pull right from the, the I came original? In, um, about we were finishing up episode eight when I came in, oh, okay. so I got to enjoy the fact that we're going to have a G one reference in that way yeah. live with everybody else. Yeah. Like, I saw the storyboards and I was like, cool. Yeah. And everybody was like, yeah, we're going to make it look like G one. I'm like, what? Yeah, it's <laughs> awesome. Because it's quite a, 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 a mashup in a way, because we're a lot of us are so used to it, every new show, it's, it's just it's like fresh continuity, and you just, I don't know, maybe it's just me, you just assume there's that you know, crossover, so it's quite a, it was quite a fun twist when it's like, oh, look, they're, they're telling the, the story of the war, and they're just literally showing you, yeah. you know, modern, modern <laughs> clips of, you know, the movie, and it's like, oh, awesome, you know. <laughs> I think that's sort of like the genius and how makes Earth Spark particularly elegant is that it's it's riffing off of G1 and saying, well, like, G1 essentially happened, but now we're here, and we're with these characters, and, yeah. and I don't know, I just, it's a delicious premise, I love it so much. Yeah, and then when Megatron arrives, and then, you know, like, oh, no. he's here, and then he's like, oh, sorry, Emily, everyone, how can I help? And, you know, we've got a, spoilers, I think it's literally the first episode of, you know, part of the premise of the show, that we've got a, a, a good guy, Megatron, um, and obviously, James, you've you've yeah, written. No one's ever done that. Before. No one's ever done that. Yeah. Can we? Um, so yeah. Can we? Can we? Moving smoothly on. Can we talk about both of your interpretations of Megatron and how you've written him? Oh sure. I also like. I think what's interesting. My journey on Transformers is on Cyberverse. I was very new to the lore and and just Transformers in general. And then by the time I get to Earth Spark, suddenly I'm the expert because, and it kind of plays to the strength. Like our show creator Dale Milanowski is like kind of new to Transformers, so when I saw that there was a good guy Megatron, I was like, "Oh shit, have you read these things?" And he was like, "No, I just thought it was a good idea." And I was like, "Oh, we should read those." <laughs> um, and I recommended them to him, and I think he did read them. But like, it was 
so exciting for me because I'm like, I already knew the potential of what could be a good guy Megatron and like that sandbox of like, we get to play with this and with this like specific setting of like, we have children, we have kid transformers so that we can really bring out the dad out of all of our older <laughs> characters. It was very exciting. And James, what about you writing? Right, right, Megatron, yeah. Megatron yeah. 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 Um, how did that come about? Yeah. Well, it came about because, um, and this is scary because, you know, time, but um, we, were, we were, John and I, John Barber and I, um, so he wrote the other ongoing at the time, and we, we, were, we had meetings with Hasbro in preparation for the, what was the thrilling 30, um, 30th anniversary stuff, so this was just, you know, this is in the lead up to um, 2014. So it was not long after the ongoing series had launched and we were talking about what well, Hasbro wanted to um, pack the comics in with, with the toys, which is great because, you know, um, comic distribution isn't huge, you know, uh, but toy distribution is, so that was an opportunity to get the comics into the hands of, um, of young, young and old minds. Um, so yeah, so we were talking about some, they wanted some, some story that would uh, tie in with the three, the 3 and 30. Um, and so we were, we were kind of blocking out Dark Cybertron, and John and I both felt, um, being sort of comic y, um, that if you're going to have some, certainly a 12 issue story, you know, something that's significant and as long as that, then there has to be some enduring shift to the, there has to be some, some change to the status quo that makes telling that story worthwhile. And so, the, the, among other things, that there, was, there was the death of Bumblebee, and he was dead for, for a long time in, in comics terms, and then there was Megatron. Uh, defecting, uh, and it wasn't me it, that uh, that suggested Megatron defecting. It, it wasn't John. It was somebody in Hasbro. Um, oh my God! Really? Yeah, it was wow. just it was a, it was it was a whiteboard idea, one of one of many, uh, and there was others on the board. And John has told this story, so I'm not you know I'm not bro broaching any kind of conferences. But we had a break, and we but we um, I think we both went to the loop. It wasn't timed. We just we ended up there, and and I was sort of saying you know there's a lot of stuff which I just don't think is going to work story-wise, because you know, this was just chucking everything. Um, and, uh, and, and, it, and Megatron the Ultimate wasn't one of those things. Um, and I said anyway, I said, look, I, if we're going to do that, then I'll, I'll have a go at that, please, I think. Because I just thought it would be such a, it's a gift really, from my perspective as a writer, to have someone like Megatron um, fresh from having defected on board the Lost Line with everybody else. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a plot engine, you know, that's an emotional engine. Um, and um, although I'd mapped out most of the season two stories already, um, the introduction of Megatron changed them all for the better, uh, in one way or another. So whether it was the uh, the, uh, the the impending threat of the D DJD, or um, just how Megatron's unique sort of response to the war, being the instigator, worked alongside the, the different crew members get, getting used to post-war life. So yeah, so it was it was just it was too. Having said all of that. When, I went, when the, the weekend was over and I was back to the hotel room and I was getting ready to fly home and I thought, I don't know how on earth I can make that work. I mean, even allowing for kind of comic book logic, you know, the sort of Magneto style things where there's all these anti-heroes and, you know, one, one month they'll defect and stuff like that. But that's, even given the slack that you're allowed within comic book sort of tropes, that is a big challenge to make, um, to make Megatron's art work. And so it took two and a half years to tell that story. Oh, well, I think you did a good job, so... <laughs> um, you mentioned the of, uh, lots of ideas that were just thrown up on the whiteboard, whether that came from Hasbro or, you know, they sort of created a team on the ground. Um, can you give us any examples, silly or otherwise, from uh, things that could have been from your respective areas? <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit on the whiteboard, hang on. <laughs> Well, this sounds, this sounds like you set me up to plug the More Than Eighty Nine notebooks, which are available on my table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, which, which are just uh, uh, for those that haven't seen them, they're just sort of a, 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 an anthology, a compendium of all the many, many, if you like, many, many whiteboards that were filled up in, in the lead up to season one and season two. Um, and so, preparing those books, going through all those ideas, um, a lot of them found their way into the book in the end. Um, there was some stuff which I, I, I kept coming up in my notes, that, that, that things like sentient rust, I just couldn't, you know, that I realised, oh, I couldn't find a way to make that work, you know. And, uh, yeah, and sort of, and um, we did the planet chasing. There were some things which is just like a, a silly hook, and, and unless you can anchor it to something, um, 
emotional and things, uh, then it's useless. So it's a lot of high concept stuff. The sentient rust, what else did we have? We had, they were going to discover the spine of Primus, which is going to be like hundreds of thousands of miles wide. Oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> that's still, a lot, well, this is a little, it's either, it's either a sort of a, a one-line pitch for something, or it's a visual, you know, that you can build a story around. I'm fascinated by your era, because please correct me if I'm wrong. By my, yeah, by my era, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm wow, the shrivel and die, and dust and dust. I'm fascinated, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there seems to be a lot of freedom, because, you know, in the TV world, like, we are writing to sell the toys, essentially. I mean, you are too, but, like, there's so much, like, our communication with Hasbro is so much more a part of the whole thing. So I'm never, I'm never really left to my own devices for too long before somebody at Hasbro has to say yes or no to that idea. That's why I'm fascinated that they were the ones who suggested Megatron defecting, because my experience of them is that you, you can pitch them anything. Um, if it's radical, it's going to take a hell of a lot of convincing to, like, get them to be like, okay, go ahead. I, th I think it speaks to, well maybe, maybe it speaks to this being 10 years ago as well, and, and, but I think it also speaks to the relative prominence um, of, of the mediums. I think, I think you know, your, yours is a TV show, it's, it's, it's out there. Um, I, think, I think by almost any metric it's, it's better known, um, but, you know. And I don't, wanna, I don't wanna imply that Hasbro were kind of hands off, because we did every, Every script that was written, um, it had a, there was two stages of approval. It had to go to the, to the editor, uh, and then if he or she were happy, then it had to go to Hasbro. Um, I do think we were lucky in, in, um, in our Hasbro contact with a guy called Michael Kelly. Um, and actually, I think he was there. He was there when I started. He was he was still there when IDW lost the license. Um, and certainly, um, he seemed very, um, I want to say, open-minded. He he was. He was keen, keen to try new things, and, here, and here's the other point. I think um, it's easier, and there's a lower risk of trying new things in comics. You know, you know, you could do. Uh, I know Megatron becoming an Autobot was, was seismic um, within fiction, within comics. But even then, you know, if it, if it hadn't worked out, you know, there's no real. I can, I can guarantee you that, like. My experiences of Debbie Hasbro is if it <laughs> if it has existed in another canon, they're much more pliable to the notion. So I imagine when Dale probably was like, "I want Megatron to be a good guy," there was someone on their end being like, "Yeah, that's happened. That's fine." <laughs> that's how we get away with a lot of gender bending. If it was if it has been gender bent before, it can exist. You've reminded me of another kind of thrill of, of you know, when you're first given the keys to this stuff. Because um, the, the notion of canon suddenly becomes really present. And you're like, God, I just need to get this approved. And once it's on the page, yeah, yeah, that's exactly. there. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's canon. It's you, can't canon. Un, you can't undo that now. You know, that's in the bank. Yeah. No, um, I, when so. I left Earthspark, I, a parting, I think I've told you this, but a parting gift I left with Earthspark was a 40-page document that I had made of here's every queer Transformer and the canon that they come from. So you can imagine a lot of that was in the comics, but I was just like, for the writer's room of the future, because I knew that stuff, and I would be the one pitching it, and I would be the one pitching it with like, this has precedence, it has existed, here it is. So I hope they continue to use that. <laughs> awesome. Um, off the back of that, both of you have written characters and relationships, um, you know, intimate or, or platonic uh, or otherwise into your respective stories. Can you tell us a bit about that? Because that's something that you know, some Transformers series you don't have a single relationship or, or, or anything in there. So how would you both, how have you written that? How have you? you know, I'd love to hear what you have to say, mostly just because in children's animation, like, there beco it becomes more of a conversation of like, okay, if we're going to have this romantic relationship, what are we trying to say for the kids? Like, how much space is it taking up? Obviously, this doesn't really apply to adult animation, but like, I've had quite a couple headaches trying to explain that just having like two queer characters existing isn't sexualizing anything. Like, I've had those conversations to be like, can we just have these people exist and be here? Um, but you obviously had the, I think, the freedom to write them as, as adults. Yeah, I, I, so I, I think, again, the kind of little disclaimer is a long word, but sort of the, the caveat that um, I think, given it was comics, in, in our own little corner doing our thing, I think we, we, 
create more opportunity. Uh, I don't think we had as many arguments or battles to fight. Um, but I mean, it's um, you know, I, I, this isn't this isn't revelatory, and it's not. It's um, it sounds okay. Put it another way, it sounds really straightforward and obvious to me that if you're going to write about characters, then you want to explore their interactions, their dynamics, you know, their, uh, you know, their rivalries and their loves and so on. Um, and what we say I was always intended as, you know, to be a, I've said it before, like a character-driven piece. Um, I've also said before that if the whole franchise is predicated on conflict and, and war, um, so you allow for that, you know, all the emotions to do with that, then just logically, you know, the, the other side, the good side is there as well. Um, and that, can, that could and should extend to romantic that was well, and, and um, you know the the instruction which really helped us actually early on um, from Hasbro was you know humanise them, and you think okay well <laughs> you know, oh I'll humanise them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you aware of our fanfic background? Fanfic background? <laughs> I'm going to humanise them. My fanfic background is really quite dry. I don't mean, know if it, my my fanfic stuff wasn't that grounded in. Um, it was. Um, I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. Talk about more. Your, more talk about more. <laughs> talk about more my fanfic. Yeah, yeah. So few people say that to me in life. So. <laughs> no, it was. All, it was. Um, I mean, I was younger, and I was coming off the G1, albeit you know TF UK, Transformers UK, which was more you know, character driven, but it was still very. You know, there was there was sort of a, it was quite humorless. It was quite plotty, quite concept driven. Um, and I discovered the joys of uh, writing about people. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm a little chagrined just because like you got the prerogative of like humanize them. That I've had the opposite, where like not necessarily that they are resistant to the idea of making them fully dimensional characters, but that specific word of humanizing them has sometimes interrupted the thought process of the people I talk to at Hasbro because I've like we've literally gotten them to be like they're not humans though. It's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, well this is I mean and uh, like maybe maybe it's cyclical, who knows what the next iteration will be sure. about. But um but I think the way the world is these days with more you know, with everything, it's all you know, it's been IP driven for a long time, but now it's all you know, everything's got to interconnect. There's there's some of these synthesis, you know, and, and stuff, and, and Bibles and things, and a lot more. There's a drive in it often to um, to have sort of one true canon and stuff like that, yeah. which I think is an inference to. I mean, we've, we've done pretty well for 40 years with a multiplicity of, um, of iterations, uh, and that has given scope to try things out and and to, and to make mistakes, and you know, but. But then the, um, I think the stuff which keeps a lot of us coming back is the, is the little the, the wobbles, um, or the little, the little gaps that are left sometimes unintentionally, which other people can find and fill in. Um, so let's hope it's not the end of that. No, I'm sure it's not. It's just I'm chagrined at our different experiences with the same company. Then we used to get notes back which said, "Turn up the gate of 15." <laughs> and you're like, are you sure 15? Yeah, we've done 13, but I said, no, turn the dial, turning a big dial marked gay and looking back. <laughs> yeah, there was. <laughs> don't, don't let me to lure you into saying something. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, uh, I am like, how do I say this? Um, I would get notes back where I was just like, I don't think they know what they're asking for. I don't think they understand that with this note, I'm gonna make it gayer. <laughs> I don't think they know that, um, but here I go. <laughs> Amazing. Um, if you could write again on Transformers, if there's a, a new project, um, what medium would you like to do? And what would you do with it if you had the freedom, if you could? I'd love to write one of the movies. One of the live yeah? movies. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And what? Woo! 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 Uh, last competition, Daddy Hasbro, in your own words. Um, <laughs> what, what would you do with it? What's your, what would be your first idea? Yeah, this is how I know I'm a true screenwriter. I'm like, no, no, no. Whatever it is they want me to write, I would make it good. <laughs> Obviously, like I would love to, I would love for it to be like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> There's a piece of me that would love to take the animated movie characters because they are the most foreign to me. 
um, even though Rodimus features heavily in your work, like, I look at the animated movie and I'm always like, that's, that was, I missed the boat on this. I can enjoy it as, as an adult, but like, there's something about it that I'm like, I know people have a nostalgia for it that I don't have. And there, as a screenwriter, I'm like, that would be a fun challenge to be like, no, fall in love with this <laughs> and, and write it good. <laughs> James, what about you? Um, well, I think, because I've kind of, I did a lot of comics, so it would be good to do, yeah, um, yeah TV. Um, well, maybe not having spoken to you now. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it'd be, oh, I don't know, I don't know. There's, a, there's always a lot of chatter, isn't there, about, oh, you know, more than meets the eye, adaptation and things like that, and um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't adapt, wouldn't adapt neatly onto the screen, but there, there is, there's, there's some structural stuff that it does carry over quite neatly. I think the biggest obstacle to that um, is, you know, more than the CI bounced off uh, a big event, which was the end of the war. And for a long time I thought, okay, well, you know, you couldn't, it'd be difficult to sell that to new audiences. But I guess maybe one, perhaps one upside of, of how things have gone over the years, and you mentioned sort of riffing, there is kind of more cross-pollination, the, the audiences are, um, I think, well, I think audio, audio, audience, audiences are underestimated anyway in terms of you know, what, they, what they can quickly pick up and what they can infer and stuff. So I don't maybe think it's as big an obstacle as it used to be pitching a new t a TV, a Transformers TV show, because of that, cause Transformers is so it's permeated everything so much. If you pitched a show or you, or you tried to sell to the audience a show which said, OK, well, we're starting with the end of this war, I think actually general audiences would be more open to that idea than maybe... 10, 20 years ago, so. Yeah. yeah. Have you written any screenplays before? I, uh, well, yeah, yes, <laughs> in, a, um, in an amateur sense. Oh, actually, so when I, um, so I'd done my fanfic years were done, and then I, then I did, did some amateur filmmaking with them, a couple of friends. I did not know that. Yeah, I know. Um, we did three, three, oh, but see, I don't want, I don't want I'm trying to think, are they available to, out, out there? Because I hope not. <laughs> um, but yeah, from, from sort of from 98 to 2003 or something, did, did, um, did two, two shorts and, um, and, and, a, and a longer, longer form piece. But, uh, and it was, it was difficult, um, but, yeah, it, but, but it, good fun. It sucks. Yeah, yeah. Um, a little, it was, I mean, it was different. We, we had control over it. We, I, I did the screenplay we, and we, I directed it, I co-directed it with someone else. Didn't star in it, but um, yeah, so I enjoyed that. Um, so yeah, there was, it was always this kind of tension, but I didn't really, didn't really think about comics as, not, as a possibility. It was, was like the idea of making films, like the idea of writing prose. Um, and I didn't, when, when more than, see more than BCR, when it was, when it was, you know, flying high, um, and I think Nick has said this before and Jack, but we didn't really, we didn't really have conversations with, with other comics companies. It wasn't as if anybody was sort of hammering on the door and saying, do you want to try this out? But, but I did have a couple of conversations with production companies about it. They did, they did come to me, actually, unusually, and said, oh, do you want to talk about pitching a TV, TV show and stuff? Oh, really? Yeah. So, um, you may know it as Succession, but I am... Um, <laughs> 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 but I said to Jesse, I said, look, I've got a great idea for a show. And he said, yeah, yeah. Um, no, but it didn't, it didn't come to anything, and, and, and I'm being very honest with the people here because I didn't really, I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't find the ideas that I thought were good enough to, to get off the ground. And actually, um, in both cases, they said, um, "Oh, just you know, blank piece of paper. You just whatever, whatever you want." I mean, obviously, several thousand miles away from it becoming a reality, but just at that point, saying, "Well, yeah, blank page, yeah, is evil." And I was like, "Oh God!" But that, but like anything, that's anything could happen. And it was exactly. just, you know, I was used to working within. Um, you said so before, didn't you? Actually, you know, like come to me and tell you broadly what you want, and I'll make it good. Yes. Um, and yeah, I, I like that. And in an IP-driven world, that tends to be the way it is. Like, like I think my upbringing in fan fiction, in particular, has made me very suited for an IP-driven world. Um, like, I have a spec script that uh, spec script being like a script that is an original idea that I'm writing on my own, kind of as an advertisement. Like, my reps are going to take it out eventually to be like, look what they can do. Um, and I've been meaning to write this thing for like six months. I haven't even gotten page one down. <laughs> but I've been doing other work. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask, like, what was your experience of like a long form screenplay versus like comics, uh, ongoing comics? Because like I can imagine the argument being that ongoing comics are just like the longest form of a screenplay. Yeah, that's a good. 
I feel bad now, you're asking me lots of good questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan. Oh, no, no, that's even worse. That's even worse. Oh. Well, likewise. Um, but don't expect any questions, because... Uh, no, uh, I th well, weird, weirdly, um, because when I, when I came, when I started doing comics, it, you know, decompressed storytelling was all the rage, and so, you know, you'd had, um, you'd have an idea or anything, well, I can stretch this over six, you'd write for the trade, you know, and you'd have one good idea and that, that's six issues. Um, but I always, again, sort of cutting, cutting my teeth as a reader on the, on the 80s stuff, it was always, well, I, I, want, I want a cliffhanger and I want to, sort of, I want to, I want to have ten good ideas and squeeze it into a two-parter and then do something else, you know. And it was very, very episodic, actually. Uh, especially the early one the ECI stuff, the season one as it's called, um, there was kind of every couple of issues, there was a different kind of different story, different theme. But when I did the very, very amateur, the emphasize uh, screenplay, um, I just kind of, uh, I went to the, the, the classic story arcs really, which was, you know, you know your, your three act structure and, you know, stuff like that really. And, and it was good not having to worry about um, runtime, things like that. Um, if I got serious about the movie making, then, um, then you know, budgeting would have come into it, which again, I'm not even going to say that actually, because Jack or any other artist will come and hit me over the head and say, <laughs> oh, it's great with comics, you can just oh, write, write a story with a just thousand drive. people in the audience, <laughs> it's a scene with a thousand in the crowd. <laughs> that's, that's what writers sound like when they're talking to artists. Yeah, there is a budget and it's there. Yeah, time. Yeah, that energy in there. Yeah. You're happiness, right. the happiness, the right. happiness, James. Yeah. Well, you know, the happiness was never. And then when you the kill deal. these characters. When you work with yeah. me, happiness is out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I think we've got about time for about ten minutes of some questions from the audience. Question you, actually. Oh, it's the first one, James. James is the first one. No, it's just because. Um, because I've had people ask me today about, oh, you know, it, uh, were you pleased to see Autumn Megatron in, um, in Earth Spark and things like that? And uh, so, questions for legacies and echoes of your work. And so, what do you, what would you, you you've written the 40 page kind of primer. So, what would you want to see carried forward? Um, not, not just in, in, in Earth Spark, but beyond. I want Nightshade to become one of the most beloved characters of all time. <laughs> I cannot take credit for Nightshade. Dale conceived of Nightshade, and there is a, a unseen, un innumerable amount of people behind Nightshade, but I feel so proud of them, and I, I want them to carry on and, and, and bring joy to, to the fandom as long as possible. I would love that. I would love um, a Starscream that is written past the point of abuse, That 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 is part of his history, not necessarily him just being like, oh, what was I, I was hurt, but like, that's just a staple of who he is and he knows that shit happened to him as he carries forward. Um, yeah! Yeah. <laughs> I think those would be the two things, please. <laughs> nice. Okay, got a first question from you earlier. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple of things, actually. First, first question is, when you're writing a character, when you're writing a character and you've got sort of like the art, like the little art you have planned for them, has there ever been a point where it's like midway you realise, oh crap, what what I planned originally isn't going to work? Look. Oh yeah, it happens. I mean like with TV, I think, particularly because TV um, seasons are getting shorter, it becomes a little bit easier to look at everything you're going to do and be able to judge it and whether or not it's going to work. But yeah, you kind of pivot and bob and weave all the time, depending on if Daddy Hasbro has thoughts later down the line. <laughs> or if something just doesn't work out. Yeah, um, agreed. And, and, and it's the best thing when that happens as well, because um, because it shows that in between you know, conceiving of the character and mapping out the arc, when you've actually come to give them life, then it's taken on something that was unexpected and you know it's become, not to get too pretentious, but it's become bigger than, what was that, sorry? What was that? She's like, yeah. So there's a little pretentious uh, button which flashes. Right next to the yeah. gear knob. It is, it is blazing. Um, well, sorry, I'm sorry, trying, sorry, I'm sorry, trying to give my all to this panel. Uh, I'll take the my soul. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, I think yeah, it's, it's 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 a good sign because it shows that um, that character has got legs and, and is um, a 
connected to that is the idea that they, you, you know, you know it's working when, when you when, when you think, well, that character simply would not do that. You know, that is that, that may have been how they were, what they were, what I planned for them to do, but actually, what they've gone through since then and their experiences and their whatever, that just doesn't ring true anymore. So it's a good, it's a good, it's a good problem to have sometimes. Good answer, Jane. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We need to reward. <laughs> okay, we've got another question at the front here. Uh, I got two questions. Uh, one, what's your favourite type of character to write? And the second one is, what has been your favourite character to write for? So, just out of all the characters you've written for. I do love a star scream, and I know that's such a basic answer, but the idea of just like, I love a person who has a lot of power, who's desperate and hungry for more, but can't attain it, and really shouldn't attain it, like arguably. Like, I just kind of like this nasty little gremlin man. Um, on my own, I write characters like that, so. Um, but the most joy, gosh, I was surprised by how much joy I had writing the Terrans, because I had been spoiled by Cyberverse of Kingdom where I really got to play with these legacy characters. But then there I was writing Transformer kids, just enjoying their lives, and I was like, oh, I really do. This is very nourishing for me in a way I didn't expect. Um, I just think the more broken, the better, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, just but in an interesting way, but, you know, sort of kind of emotionally, Damaged, um, but but in a, oh, I'm going to go I'm going to go deeper than this. But no, in, in a way which, um, but in a, in a way which, which which has coherence, which makes sense. And, and if you if you go back far enough, you'll that, that you can account for that damage. And um, and then because there is a part two, and then seeing seeing how that person over time you know reacts and comes to terms with and and, and acts on it. And and um, I guess to answer the other part of your question, really, if if that kind of arc ends with them in a better place, uh, in a healthier place, and that, that's, that's satisfying to write. Or, or dead. Or dead. <laughs> or dead. <laughs> it's, it's easy to do with characters that live for millions of goddamn years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Until James, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I can't see what my kids, but please ask you there, okay. Um, so, sorry, um, first of all, I would just like to say um, thank you for this panel because, well, I want to become a writer myself, and so hearing all of this is very encouraging for me. And just, um, so thank you so much for putting this panel on. And my actual question is well, of course, with writing for an existing IP, you have to, that you can utilize pre existing characters, but when it comes to creating you know, original characters, like for example with Mortar Meets the Eye, with characters like Run or Pharma, were there any particular difficulties in creating original characters? And if so, how did you tackle them? Were they from your fan fiction? <laughs> I have stolen shit from my own fan fiction all the time. So you saved that well, actually. Because, um, well, <laughs> you, you, you've tapped into this persistent theory that uh, it's just like an army of Mary Sue's um, in my work. He, I hate that that word is used like it's a dirty word. I know, I didn't like using it in, in, a, in a dirty way. But, yeah. um, so, in, in, um, again, it's one, one difference between our mediums is uh, it's far easier and lower risk to have an original character in a comic because, you know, you, Yes, it still needs to be designed, but it's a lot less costly. Um, but I don't think that's what you're asking. But in terms of sort of um, why and how they come about, in more than meets the eye, it was where simply there wasn't a pre-existing character that, that had that function or had that um, skill set. Uh, sometimes, you know, clinically in an immersory way, it's someone you know isn't going to be around very long, so it's a kind of kind of red shirty as well. Um, Working with people like Nick and Alex and Jack, who are really good character designers, that, that was always kind of a, an incentive as well. You know, you could just, like with the DJD, you know, it was saying to Alex, okay, well, they all turn into instruments of death. Um, I know one of them's got a badge for a face. Um, these are the kind of rock modes. And, and then you'd, you know, some incredible magic that you would be, you'd come up with. 
come back having worked very hard and so what about this and you think oh my god so when when you're working with people like that and, and that's what's you know the prize it becomes very tempting to say okay well actually here's another original character and, you know, um, but yeah I suppose from from a storytelling point of view it was it, there's a there's a plot driven need there is a there is a a rung shaped hole or a farmer shaped hole that needs to be filled okay nice okay got a question over there Thank you. So obviously we have two generations of LGBTQ includedness in Transformers. We have, you know, one of the first, if not the first LGBTQ relationship, first envy character here in Earthspark. So what I want to ask is, is there any kind of diversity that you couldn't include because Hasbro wouldn't sign off on it or you didn't know how to do it right or you just couldn't fit it in anywhere? And if so, what would that be and where would they go? Make it gayer. <laughs> The gay agenda. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's your often word. It's true. I have become the gay agenda. agenda. <laughs> um, I definitely, I constantly was trying to get trans RC into our show because I, I think trans RC and like Nightshade, I was so desperate to have Nightshade have a uh, queer elder in that was also a bot and you know that somewhat is tarantulas to a certain extent. Um, but I also really wanted to get Drift and Ratchet in there as like gay husbands, like having them already be married. Um, no, I'm constantly in the background being like, that could be gay. If you <laughs> wanted it to be. <laughs> but you don't? That's fine. I can't add anything to that. <laughs> Do you ever get pushback? Like ever on anything? Um, <laughs> they, were, they just, were they just as, like. As a, as a cis hetero white male, no. <laughs> Because sometimes, like like I said, I would get notes on so, some things, and I'd be like, I don't think they know that this means I have to make it gayer. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> I can't. I'm, what I'm imagining is a Hasbro exec like reading your stuff and being like, Wow, they're such good friends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the early days, you had to tread carefully because you didn't know. You didn't know what was going to um, meet resistance or not. So, um, apologies for those that have heard it before, but I'll just very quickly, you know, the, the Chrome Demon Rewind, and then they were, I guess you could say, they were coded as friends until the point when it was time to push the button and say, no, they, was, you know, that they were in love and they were um, a couple. And, and so, yeah, that, on that occasion, not knowing the lay of the land I did make, it wasn't 40 pages, but I made, I made an argument appended to the script saying, this is why it's fine. And it was fine. Um, but what was incredibly useful is I never sent this to everybody here and everybody that read more than ECI, um, you know, never underestimate the power of the readership, in my case, the readership being cool with it, or saying that this is good, or saying we would like more of this, please. Um, there, was, there was some pushback among the readers, um, I came, I came across very little, but um, but the warmth of the reception and the celebration of what you're doing emboldens us as creators um, and gives gives extra license, no pun intended, but gives you extra license to try new things. And so, by the time we got to Lost Light and um, you know we introduced trans characters, and, and that was not an issue. Um, no, it might be that. Um, Given that they're mechanical, perhaps you know there's, it's slightly easier in some ways to sell it. Um, but it, but that doesn't matter because because we, we got it and it was on the page and like we said before, that's it. That's it now. You know you can't be undone. You can't undo what you had for breakfast. And and that stuff you know stuff that matters is, is there now. So um, it's yeah, there's precedent. Okay. Okay. We have time for one last question. So you've got um, someone back then. Um, so, for James, I was wondering, what was the thought process behind your interpretation of Star Saber? <laughs> and did it include anything about Warhammer? Because it feels very Warhammer. Yeah, um, oh yeah. Now there's no angry people. You know what I know? You brought up my big faux pas. Somebody uh, yesterday came up to me and said, you know, Soto Bocci. I was okay with his star saving. <laughs> but he had to whisper it. Because he knew. Um, yeah, no, I am. Um, okay, so at this point in, in, in IW, 
there's a lot of the original characters have been, had been used, you know, there, was, there wasn't many left. If you wanted a new, new character, you didn't want to create someone from, from, from scratch. And Star Saber is, you know, he's a great looking character. Um, you know, he's got, relatively speaking, he's got some, some name recognition. Um, but I underestimated the strength of feeling around his uh, <laughs> Japanese, evidently, his Japanese interpretation. Um, and I thought there was something fun, evidently, not that fun, <laughs> in, in, in sort of making a virtue of flipping it around and, and having him be this kind of zealous. Um, uh, that, that's a, that's a, an idea, going back to other questions, because originally in season three, he was going to, there was going to be a band of kind of psychopathic pilgrims. He was going to head off a team and just go around and kill all atheists, um, which would have just compounded the issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was. Uh, I thought um, I underestimated the attachment people had to stuff, but I wouldn't do it any differently. <laughs> I think you really summed up our careers too, like underestimating the feeling or, or <laughs> estimating correctly like our entire jobs. <laughs> it just feels. It just feels. Okay, unfortunately, that is all the time we have. This panel. So, can we please give a big round of applause?